And welcome to the ANU College of Asia and Pacific. I'm Dr. Ross Tapsell from a lecturer in the School of Culture, History and Language. And I'm here with Professor A.B. Shamsul from the National University of Malaysia and Professor Bridget Welch, Associate Professor Bridget Welch. Um, and we're here to talk about the ANU Malaysia Singapore update, which is going on in Canberra here f tomorrow and Thursday. Welcome to Canberra, welcome to the cold. I hope it's not too, not too freezing for you. Exciting times for Malaysia and Singapore. Um, what are the chances for, for greater political liberalisation in both countries as we begin to discuss the update uh, and both countries uh, tomorrow and Thursday? Well, I don't know about Singapore, uh, but I know in Malaysia there are a lot of uh, talk about wanting to open up, but uh, I think uh, it's very, very slow, or if it's happening at all, and I think the task is uh, how do we increase uh, people's ability to actually uh, being consulted and uh, government being open to all the uh, criticism that, uh, that has been brewing up for a very, very long time. I think this is uh, the main task that we have to face. I'd add a little bit more. I think yeah. that there needs to be, uh, um, in the system itself, there's an immaturity in the political discourse uh, that I think is actually, you know, uh, people get engaged in personal attacks, uh, basically often fabricating lies, uh, and the focus is not on, is on attacking the messenger, as a, and the messenger as opposed to dealing with the message and the issues of questions of reform. And I think at this particular juncture, you know, one of the challenges Malaysia faces uh, is that we, you have a situation of weakening political institutions. And this is across the board. And one of the impact of GA13 was that the institutions are weaker. And so when you combine that with immaturity in political discourse and um, in the system itself, uh, uh, as well as weak institutions, and leaders that are not stepping up to the plate, you're having very big challenges for political liberalization. Shabtul, do, do you agree with weak political institutions or is well, leadership a big problem in Malaysia? If I see that the opposition and the ruling party, they are equally weak in that sense. Yeah. So we are facing two groups of people who are actually from the same school for a long, long time. So I think this weakness that we are experiencing, as Bridget says, is actually su is being suffered. I mean, the suffering is being watched and experienced by both. Mm. And I think this is the great difficulty. Because I also see what happens at the state level uh, as a consequence of this uh, difficult to getting out from the old framework. Do you think they're equally weak, Bridget? Actually, I disagree with Shamsul. I think that, uh, um, well, I think both sides have significant space to move and to, to, to change the discourse. And, and I think there are important signs of people addressing policy issues, I think, on both sides of the political divide. I think the challenge now it really has to do, especially with an UMNO in the post-Mahathir situation. We're 10 years after Mahathir's government, but Mahathir continues to play in a prominent role in, in the legacy that he's left behind, which is there is not a clear set of leaders that have come out of his shadow. Do we need to change leadership in, in, uh, within UMNO? Is the problem, Najib, and again also with the opposition, is the problem that Anwar's been around for too mm. long and we need a change of leadership? Well, UMNO is a sponge party it gets and absorbs everything that comes and it spits out. A lot of it is money that it gets. Well, it spits out the same people like Anwar, Tunku Razali. So for me, I'm not, unlike, uh, say, Congress Party or LDP in Japan, there's a lot more apparent uh, willingness to absorb all this dirt or clean or whatever you want to call them. And this is why they have survived for so long, because of this ability to change accordingly. So almost... Uh, almost uh, uh, taking the shape of things around them. So I think in many ways when, when, when we see, I mean, this recent attempt by both sides to find a reconciliation, so-called, is an all unknown strategy. Let's talk, uh, Bridget, a little bit about the PAP in Singapore. Uh, how do you see the movement for greater political liberalisation within the PAP? Can they change to this in this new landscape? Uh, what, what is the future there for the PAP? Well, I think the systemic issues are at play in Singapore as well. Um, we saw after the first, after the election in 2011, an attempt to open up 
um, and one of the key elements of that was the Singapore conversation. But we've seen in the last year, it really, I think, more a closure of the system. Closing internet space, for example, mm. is one example. Uh, you also have a situation where there is an attempt to try to push everything into a conformist mentality. Mm. And one of the things that both Malaysia uh, uh, and Singapore face, and both the PAP and UMNO face, is they want to make the groups that they represent into a conformist perspective. They say all the Malays are the same, which in fact they're not. The Malays are a rich, diverse culture, right? uh, and, and very, very vibrant. Huh? And the same thing in Singapore, right? All the, 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 those, the communities that represent, there is much more pluralism and diversity. And I think both countries are dealing with the challenges of dealing with pluralism. And I think this is especially acute in Singapore, because Singapore is a country that is actually, you know, it's, made, it's extremely elitist in terms of its leadership. And so it, it has lost the pulse of that diversity and in the society itself. And I think this is the challenge the PAP is facing. Mm. Well, for me, I think uh, the challenge of disconnectedness in some way that uh, what Bridget is talking about uh, is very obvious to me, whether in Singapore, whether in Malaysia. Uh, be, despite of uh, meeting the people and so on and so forth, which has become ritualized rather than being used as a conduit to actually extract uh, what people think, you know. So, uh, in Malaysia, I believe they have done in a way that also fulfill the immediate need of the local leaders rather than the need of the people beyond the party. I think this is the, the, the strange and the difficult part and that's the result of being disconnected. And, and, and as a result, of the, the general Malay populace, uh, you can see they are drifting from UMNO mm. for that simple mm. reason. They are not being heard. Mm. and they don't want to be hurt anymore because mm. they were willing to find an alternative space. Mm. Bridget mentioned internet censorship before. Uh, part of this being the changing yeah. landscape yeah. Uh, in both Malaysia and Singapore. Do you think UMNO and PAP are both ready to embrace greater media liberalisation and a diversity of viewpoints in the public sphere in both countries? Or will there be resistance? Will we see a backlash and uh, attempts on greater control as we've perhaps seen with some of these internet censorship in well, both countries. Malaysia has, uh, they don't, they have no censorship on internet. What they are doing is trying to chase people whom they disagree, whatever they are saying through these new laws regarding uh, communication. And that is the way they're dealing with it. While they have this rule that there's no uh, censorship, but there are other ways and means to actually effect or deter people from making criticism by chasing them, putting them publicly uh, for, for, for people to see, to shame them. I think this is what is happening in the context of Malaysia. Not exactly censorship, but uh, another way of doing the same thing in a mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a chilling effect. <laughs> and you have the paid cyber bloggers who basically pay, use lies. And, and, and it's basically hit and run tactics that are actually quite common. And they're funded by political actors in H the system. How's a hit and run tactic? Basically, you tell a lie and that's it. You're gone all right? And in that process. And it doesn't matter what the impact of that. It's something that they throw into the, into, into the arena. And, and then they just run away from it as if, it's, as if it you know, becomes something that was true. But in fact, they don't take responsibility for their actions. And I think one of the challenges that media faces uh, is that the marketplace is driving a lot of this cessationalism, but you also have political actors that are also driving mm -hmm. some of this. Mm -hmm. But these are all tricks, what we call weapons of the week. Huh? Uh, it's just that the weapons of the week, rumor mongering, food dragging, these are there already in the system. Now it's being electronified. This but I disagree with Trump. Yeah. I think it's weapons of the rich. It's weapons of the elite using the system for their own interests. And I think this is what you're seeing here in this type of discourse. They're not weak at all. They're going after the people who are actually challenging them. Yeah, these are techniques, weapon of the weak, because they don't reveal who they are. So they use somebody else. So this is exactly because there's no rules. It's a bit like sniping. You snipe in, in Yugoslavia somewhere, the snipers are always more powerful than the army in many ways. So I think this is what is happening. But who finances the snipers? This is also a big question. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things we haven't covered is political demonstrations. Yeah. Talk about weapons of the week. Um, do you see that there could be greater political demonstrations, particularly in Singapore, uh, in the future? Is this something that the government is more willing to accept now in both countries? 
Well, in Malaysia, I think uh, what uh, happened after the election has mm. showed us, even though uh, the authority said you have to send 10 days beforehand mm. uh, permission, mm. request for, for, for demonstration, I think they went ahead. And I, you must remember also that when we talk about the police, when we talk about the army, we talk about demonstrators, we don't, we don't think they are out there. The policemen is there, the army is there. They are all relatives, cousin. All these things are playing out in that. So it's very difficult uh, for, for us to see analytically that these are separate things. So that's why I think when we talk about demonstration in Malaysia, we are looking at the children of the policemen, cousin and so on, already inside the, uh, inside the, uh, the rallies. Yeah? And this is what we know. Mm -hmm. So somehow they feel, uh, well, let's see what happens. As long as it's not violent, I think this is what. But I think there's something more systemic at play, and that is, you know, GE13 was the most participatory election in Malaysia's history. Many people came in with high levels of expectation, and I think there are concerns about how that election took place. And this is a catalyst for people to move outside the system. When the system, when you cannot, when the rules of the game are made to be so uneven, people do not participate in the same nature of politics. They take, they adopt different repertoires of politics, and I think what we're seeing, not just in Malaysia, a global phenomenon, there is concerns about the electoral process, whether or not it's in Egypt or whether or not it's in Malaysia, and I think in Singapore there's still faith in the process, even though it is clearly an uneven process as well. Uh, but I think when if it becomes more competitive, Competitive, that will be the test that it plays. And I, I think in Malaysia, you're seeing more people going to the streets because there has been an, a failure of the institutions, a failure of the system to address the conflicts and contestation in the system itself. But there's also a reality in Malaysia where people are put, social mobility is number one, which means that I want to get my education, I want to work, and I get my money. And shall we not disturb the system? So there is this contestation between people who want to change and people who want to move forward because they have compared with Egypt, they have compared with uh, some other countries, they said, what happened to this Arab Spring? It doesn't end somewhere where they imagine it's going to be. So shall we now follow that path or shall we reconsider? This is also the debate that we have in Malaysia. And this will be one of the many debates that we'll be having in the ANU College of Asia and Pacific over the next two days. So thanks very much, A.B. Samshel, Bridget Welsh, thanks very much for coming in. You can stream live and, uh, and on YouTube our ANU Malaysia Singapore update. It will also be on the college website and also on the new Mandala website. Look forward to your attendance there. Thanks very much.